My name's Joel Stern. I'm a research fellow at the School of Media and Communication at RMIT and the co-curator of this hideous replica, which I'll speak about more in a moment. But firstly, I want to acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and Bun Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands RMIT University stands. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So tonight's gonna to be an extraordinary event, um, something I've been looking forward to for months, I know many of you have as well. Um, just before introducing the presenters and uh, performers, I'd um, like to give a, a little bit of background context and some thanks, of course. To start with the context, um, tonight's event is part of a broader experimental project called This Hideous Replica, which I've co-curated with Sean Dockray. The project explores how processes like replication, reproduction, doubling and cloning have become defining features of contemporary experience, particularly in the context of algorithmic culture, data, capitalism and life lived online. So many things seem to appear to us as copies of copies of copies, as production and reproduction merged into one another. Sean and I and our collaborators have been living with this project for some time and we've begun seeing hideous replicas everywhere on our screens in the street, um, creeping up on us in the corridors of the university. They might be real, those ones. At the center of the project, is an exhibition at RMIT Gallery and First Sight Gallery, which is on now and runs until November. It features works by Australian and international artists. And alongside the exhibition is a series of events at the intersection of art and research, this being one which we're calling Replica School. And it's intended to be understood as both a replica of a school and a school of replication. Just before I uh, introduce uh, the talent, as they say, for tonight. Um, I'll take a moment to thank the RMIT Culture team for their expert production of this event and the entire project. Um, we've also received generous support from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society, RMIT's Nonfiction Lab, the Music Industry Research Collective, and the RMIT Design and Creative Practice Enabling Impact Platform and finally, Monash Art, Design and Architecture. Okay, now to introduce the guests. Um, firstly, we have Mackenzie Walk, who, as many of you will know, is an amazing Australian writer and theorist who's been based in New York for two decades and is a professor at the New School for Social Research. Mackenzie is an exceptionally prolific writer who always seems to have three or four books circulating at once that fully resonate with the desires, anxieties, and preoccupations of the present. Two crucial early books, Gamer Theory and A Hacker Manifesto, were discussed in depth at RMIT in a reading group yesterday. And it was something that I hadn't um, realized until revisiting the book in preparation for the reading group, um, A Hacker Manifesto, that it begins with the line, a double spooks the world, the double of abstraction, which is a great credo in a way for this entire project. More recent books by Mackenzie include Capital is Dead, Raving and Reverse Cowgirl. Something that's been very clear across the run of recent events in Melbourne, and we've worked Mackenzie pretty hard. She's had um, events almost every day, um, but it's been obvious how she has an ability to connect with readers across disciplines and generations. It sort of feels like each book has a dedicated fan base of its own. Mackenzie's talk today, which responds directly to the project theme, is titled From Automatic to Automated Writing and follows on from the Ursula Franklin lecture that she delivered at University of Toronto earlier this year. Directly following Mackenzie without intermission, We'll welcome Irish composer, performer, and artist Jennifer Walsh, who's Professor of Composition at University of Oxford. 
Jennifer's one of the world's leading figures working at the intersection of experimental music and conceptual art, and was someone who became interested very early on in how technologies of artificial intelligence and machine learning might transform music and culture more broadly. She's an incredibly compelling and funny performer, so if you haven't seen her before, prepare to be surprised, shocked, entertained. Jennifer's performance tonight is an audiovisual audio work from 2017 titled, Is It Cool to Try Hard Now? And finally, following Jennifer's performance, we'll invite her and Mackenzie back on stage um, for a short conversation reflecting on their own and each other's works. So thanks again, everyone, for being here, and please welcome Mackenzie Walk. Hi. All right, so this is called uh, From Automatic Writing to Automated Writing. Uh, my thanks to Joel and everyone at RMIT uh, and Monash who got me here. Um, but let's have at it. There's been a blizzard of hype about so-called AI uh, that can write, and much of it seemingly written by it. The debates about this circle around a particular notion of what a writer is and does. The debate assumes that authors are the origins and owners of their textual worlds, and that what attests to their authorship is at least a minimal amount of originality and therefore AI becomes an author if, it is, if its product is original, and the dispute turns on whether it meets that criteria. But what if an author isn't the origin of a text? So let's take a walk through a century of challenges to that notion, from surrealist automatic writing to data cut-ups, fluxus chance methods, Ulupo rule sets, and situationist detournement. Perhaps it's more that texts make authors than that authors make texts. If texts make authors, this upends the conceit of authors at, as little god creators of their textual worlds, which is the basis author, also of an author's copyright claims and livelihood. Defending the slim chance of making some money as a writer rests on the fiction about authorship, one that so-called AI is not the first to challenge, which leads us to the central role of property as that which enables most writers to make money and that which the owners of AI subvert. Uh, yeah, just today, Internet Library uh, losing a legal challenge, and at the same time, OpenAI's CEO saying, unless we can get the source material for free, we're not profitable. And it's like, yeah, dude. <laughs> so AI confirms much of what the avant-garde has actually been saying all along about writing, but the results are hardly the kind of creative liberation that such movements intended. So first, some context. I'm old enough to have lived through two rather different eras of textual production. These are photographs of my own coffee table from sometime in the 90s, I think, or even the 80s. Uh, when I started out as a writer and scholar in the 80s, computation was only just starting to change the form of written production. Ah, we're not ready for Walt yet. Yeah. <laughs> The world of writing was one of newspapers, magazines, and books. The world of scholarship was one of printed academic journals and monographs. Much of my time was spent in libraries and bookstores. The textual property system was already becoming a bit leaky, however, thanks to photocopying. It was the world of what? Walter Benjamin called mechanical reproducibility. The capacity to perceive and act in the world was mediated by mass-produced copies of the text. And of course, the world of print had already been displaced by the world of broadcasting, um, thinking of how the envelope of broadcast media changed the social sensorium was actually one of the ma my main interests as a young writer and scholar. And maybe what made me a media scholar, however, was seeing uh, Marshall McLuhan on Australian television in 1977 on a show called Monday Conference. Anybody here remember Monday Conference? No one wants to out themselves as that old. That experience changed my whole worldview. And one of the things that always interested me about McLuhan is what he learned about media from paying attention to avant-garde writers, uh, particularly Ezra Pound and Wyndham Lewis. Avant-gardes, uh, when they're interesting, are kind of always avant-gardes of media. They're probes of possibility. 
Now, one popular image of the poet is someone who has special subjective experiences or a unique identity that gives the text they produce the stamp of originality. And this is strangely at odds with another view of the poet as one who is possessed by the muse as an empty vessel for something beyond themselves. And those contradictory images of the poet are actually sort of also subtly gendered. The poet is, is either the possessor of his world or she is kind of seized by the otherworldly. And the tension between those two concepts of the poet turns on the question of property. Who owns the words a poet makes? The concept of the poet as unique originator, possessor of a world he has made, an original world manufactured from the raw materials of his own experience and identity, fits a lot better with the modern regime of ownership, which assigns the rights in the work to the writer as a legal entity. Now, the other view in which the poet is a vessel for the muses poses something of a conundrum for property relations. The muses know nothing of private property. Theirs is a universal, abstract, endless universe of creation. And oddly enough, most avant-garde revive that classical vision of the poet as the one possessed against the modern form of authorship as the origination of private property. And they also sort of point beyond it. Uh, Arthur Rimbaud, the poet as boy genius, is sometimes mistaken for the model of the poet whose, whose identity and subjective experience are at the origin of his work. But in two famous letters, which form something of a manifesto for his poetry, he dismisses mere subjective poetry. The poet is one who, through a derangement of the senses, is spoken through rather than speaking. The poet is the one whom language penetrates. The wood is not to blame if it wakes up a violin. Now, Dada had a rather more prosaic method of making poetry, simply cut up a bunch of texts and throw the resulting word confetti into a bag, draw them out at random and write it down, or write poems without words at all, using sound rather than sense as a medium. And the surrealists took uh, Rombo and Dada and pushed even further uh, in the direction of cutting the author out as the sort of subject that makes writing. Automatic writing is perhaps the most interesting example. The writer induces a state of dissociation, disengaged from intention, allowing language to write itself. And then the letterists, this is the game with avant-garde, right? Sort of try to go even further. Borrowing from data, they sort of chisel language down to its smallest elements, particles of sounds, letters rather than words. And the fluxus approach then in, uh, introduces chants. A throw of the dice will never abolish chance, as Mallarmé wrote, but perhaps chance could be the means towards uh, poetry that produces itself. And then the uh, Olupo group went in the opposite direction. It's like you go too far in one direction. It's like, let's head back in the other. Uh, a literature of constraints. Language is constraint-based, a matrix of rules and habits, and poetry, too, has rules. The rules of the sonnet, for instance, or the sestina. Well, why not make up new ones? From the constraint comes entire universes, like uh, Raymond Queneau's 100 billion poems. It's 10 sonnets with the same rhyme scheme, and the lines of which can then be recombined into uh, a billion poems. Isidore Ducasse, who uh, made himself the Comte de L'Autriamont, uh, was little known in his, his, in his own time, uh, but his masterpiece, The Song of Mal de Roar, was a surrealist rediscovery. The situationist preferred his only other known work, the Poesies, uh, and with its famous declaration, plagiarism is necessary, progress implies it. And the Poesies are a series of rewritings of famous maxims by previous writers, all just sort of slightly modified and twisted. And this became a whole approach to writing in the hands of the situationists, and they called it detournement, like the detour. In the 50s, there was a bit of a scandal when it turned out that Lautriamont had not only plagiarized the, the posies, which everyone would know, because French literary people would recognize the modifications, but also chunks of Mel de Roar. So on the posies, you know, this was obvious. Uh, but with Mal de Roar, it turned out that some of the most admired pas poetic passages were actually from textbooks of natural history. So detournement isn't plagiarism in that it does not intend to pass off another's work as that of the author. And if anything, it's sort of the opposite. So Lautremont announced his own method in the posies. 
And as the situation is theorized, detournement is a practice that articulates the concept of literary communism, that language is made by all and for all. It's, it's sort of the celestial language uh, of the muses brought down to earth. So detournement prefigures a world without property, the free creation of language by all and for all. Now, there's a certain irony in all these avant-garde strategies which pointed beyond the notion of the author as God creator, uh, which is that these became the famous names that originate ideas about the unoriginality of authorship. Their works are all owned by someone, or uh, if they have passed in the public domain, are given new life as private property through fresh editions. And ironically, uh, Rem Quenot, who may be the author whose estate uh, now owns the largest chunk of writing as private property ever, right? Because the Quenot estate is billions of poems. A 1997 court case uh, found for his publisher, Gallimard, against the online publication of the poem. So Gallimard now owns 100,000 billion poems, all attributed to Quenot, now private property of that publisher. So avant-garde visions for writing free from property came to pass, but like, all utopias actually end up coming to pass. There's just always an asterisk. There's always like, oh, actually, but with this caveat. And the digital age separated in an efficient way the form of the work from the form of its material substrate. A digital file is in principle easy to copy and circulate with a very low cost of transmission. So we found ourselves in an era of literary communism after a fashion but with an asterisk. So I was an active participant in the avant-garde of free digital art and writing in the 90s. It went by multiple names. It was perhaps a new kind of distributed, networked, leaderless avant-garde movement. The loose group to which I mostly belonged was called Net Time. We were done with cyberspace. It was Net Time. Right? <laughs> uh, as I wrote at the time, information wants to be free, but is everywhere in trains. That's a, a thesis for this book. And that slogan is itself already a detournement. It's part Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau and part John Perry Barlow. Uh, our practice in net time was collaborative filtering and our art was less one of writing. There were so many words in the world already, so much as editing. So free culture was a controversial development for working writers who depended on copyright for their our income. And I find myself on both sides of that as I depend on income from writing as my second job to supplement my professor's salary because living in New York ain't cheap. So I had rather mixed feelings about discovering a so-called pirate edition of, of my book, Raving, in Colombia. Uh, the person who had it even asked me to sign it. <laughs> Neither I nor my non-profit publisher would actually see any money for it, from its existence, right? On the other hand, it enables readers in Latin America to access my writing more cheaply. And in some ways, it's actually a better edition. The cover was on better stock, and it had French flaps. <laughs> and it's more of like a Shanzai uh, product, as they used to say in China, a sort of elaboration that actually made minor improvements. Uh, so the information economy can work in paradoxical ways. Um, most of my books are freely available as PDFs from ARG and from elsewhere. Uh, the ones that are most widely pirated are the ones that sell best. I make more money from commissions and appearances like this one than I make from royalties, and I think of the free copies as advertising. Now, this works for writers like me, who love doing appearances, uh, that I was able to leave Australia and have a career in North America at all was probably due to participating in the free culture movement, because that when I was trying to get jobs, that's what people knew me from the internet. It's like, oh yeah, you're in that time. So the heyday of free culture, such as it was, ended up being short-lived. The problem with anything that's free is that someone will figure out how to exploit it. And this has come in several stages. The old media industry didn't love free culture and tried to shut it down. Um, oh yeah, there's, you can, there's, there's all my books for free. Uh, as Cory Doctorow has shown, they ended up creating an, like, an astonishingly extensive techniques of surveillance and encryption to protect what they see as their property, this you know, so-called digital rights management. So thanks to digital rights management, we now have sort of North Korea levels of intrusive surveillance on all of our devices just to stop, say, unauthorized use of Donald Duck, you know. Meanwhile, Donald Duck lives rent-free in my head, and I wish he wouldn't. <laughs> Disney should pay me storage fees. The newer media industries were rather more creative about it. They encouraged free culture in order to capture value from it in another way, and hence the era of platforms. 
the new media industries created friendly seeming platforms for gathering free producers, creating a culture together, and sold us to advertisers, both as a quantity of attention with known properties, but also as a sort of social graph to be surveilled and studied for emergent patterns. So, you know, capitalism exploits our labor and extracts a surplus from it, uh, but whatever this emerging economy is, and maybe it's not even capitalism anymore, it's something worse, uh, it also exploits our non-labor, our communism, our desire to share and commune with each other. And what's kind of like even worse is, you know, like you might have been, ex might have been and still be exploited as wage labor, uh, but you're sort of exploited as digital creators and they don't even pay you at all, right? It's unwaged. It's, it's unwaged non-labor, non if that you know, means anything, can mean anything. So one can mention here five enormous corporations whose platforms have shaped the practices of reading and writing into something else. Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Well, a couple of those have now have different names. Each looks like a platform, but might be better described with uh, Benjamin Bratton's term, the stack. They're like giant privately owned infrastructures that coordinate activity through a series of layers that capture value and extract a surplus. And the layers of the stack, according to Benjamin, are user, interface, address, city, cloud, and earth. <clears throat> the Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon stacks each present us with no other way of being than as a user. Let's just pause off the idea of being users again for a sec. Everyone becomes a user. engaged by an interface behind which is a sort of dynamic system of addressing, which knows who we are, what we are, where what we want is, and how to get it for us at what price. Delivering to us our wants and desires builds entire cities with distinctive spatial forms, all of which is coordinated by massive data centers, somewhat misleadingly referred to as clouds. At the bottom of the stack always is what Bratton calls Earth, and the limitless demand for continual expansion that the stack places on it. So Earth just appears to a stack as a set of quantifiable resources and associated risks. Now, there are other stacks, uh, but for those of us who read and write, who are concerned about culture, knowledge, news, governance, these five are the big ones, to which we could add a sixth kind of stack, uh, which is still sort of information and is known as ed tech just as publishing and journalism have been hollowed out and transformed into digital flows by the stack. Education's going that way too. It's just not clear yet if and who will emerge as the biggest owner and extractor. And that's sort of, that's my workplace now, yeah? You sort of think of professor, chalkboard, classroom. No, this is my actual workplace, is that screen, right? So the newspaper and the book of my generation uh, first knew them are gone and the university as we once knew it is, is on its way. Although, of course, one might want to resist these things. The hollowing out of university will be sold in much the same way as the hollowing out of the book and the newspaper, that it's all for the convenience of the user. But, of course, it's really about extraction, not just replacing labour with tech, but controlling labour, disorganising it, subjecting it to surveillance and control, not to mention the training of generations into the subjectivity of the user rather than, for example, as citizens. Now, this wasn't the future those of us in the avant-garde of free culture wanted. Our tactics for generating free culture production broke out of the old technical and economic forms of control and exploitation, but generated the free resources that could be captured and recuperated on a more abstract level by emerging kinds of information business. Indeed, maybe by a new kind of ruling class. And that was sort of the proposition of this book. One which controls the value chain by owning and controlling stocks, flows, and above all sort of vectors of information via stack infrastructures. Now currently we have a sort of hybrid economy. A lot of information is free, much of it of dubious quality. There's still a culture industry protected by intrusive digital rights management, and it's still profitable for a handful of highly consolidated companies from Disney to Bertelsmann. The marketing of those protected products relies on the free information economy uh, to drive users toward them. Uh, I guess while we're having brat summer in, in America, you're having brat winter down here? Is this reference land? Yeah, all right. <laughs> so here perhaps is a good place to pose, but I think of it as the sort of Harold Innes question. 
Does the design of this media ecology function on both its time-binding and space-binding axes in ways that are self-correcting, open to creative evolution, and balance freedom and care? And I think the answer is definitely not, yeah? At the bottom of Bratton Stack is that layer called Earth, and the signal we can dimly pick up from that level is that like, none of this will endure much longer, uh, but that signal tends to be lost in the noise. Which brings us uh, to the moment of automated rather than automatic writing. Once there were platforms containing extensive archives of free culture, it was only a matter of time before there were other ideas about how to exploit them. And so-called AI is sort of the next stop in the extraction of value from them to automate the production of new texts out of old texts by training a computational algorithm on this now free uh, corpus. In her uh, 1989 CBC Massey lecture, until I first gave this in Canada, right? It's got a lot of Canadian references. Uh, Ursula Franklin distinguished between holistic and prescriptive technologies. It's an interesting approach as she centers labor in her thinking about tech. So holistic technologies expand the creative possibilities of the kind of work one can do with them. They're part of a poetics of free creation. That was how I felt about when I learned digital typesetting or desktop publishing or got my first Apple Macintosh, or was experimenting with intimate writing cultures such as NetTime. All of that felt like a holistic technology in the sense that they were expanding my capacity as a writer, editor, publisher to create and connect through text. But as it turned out, that sort of was the path not taken. Later generations of writing technology became prescriptive. Like that, that thing in Microsoft Word that tells you what the next word is supposed to be. I'm, I'm just sort of like, get out of my head. It's all about control, surveillance, uh, and quantification of the labor process, and eventually the attempt to replace the agency, not just of the writer, but also of the editor and the reader with machines. Machines decide what you read based on what uh, an algorithm thinks will hold your attention long enough to show you the ad. So we've not reached the point at which machines write novels or make films, but machines already decide a lot of what appears on screen. If you search for information on Google, uh, it's sort of like, oh yeah, did I, did I skip Wendy? She was in there somewhere. Uh, if you search for, search for information on Google, it no longer presents just links to other websites. It presents automated digests of those websites to try to get you to stay on Google. And so like, it wants you not to go find out anything else about this character. It's sort of digested it for you. It's sort of mostly right. Every now and then, this weird stuff gets in it. Facebook likewise automates what you will see in your feed and prefers that you stay on the site rather than leave it for a news source. In short, editing has already been automated. Ah, oh, I got my slides in the wrong order. As Wendy Chan argues, our media, for, our media forms our habits as users and prompts us to sort of reform them, update them, as if the solution to any problem was an individual one, for which there's an app or an update to the app, and it gets us looped into repetition, reading things we didn't choose, writing things we don't know we didn't choose to not write which might as well have all been written by machines. And this is maybe what's most awesome, irksome about so-called AI. Not that it write, what it writes looks like what humans write, but rather that what a lot of humans write looks like it was written by machines already. <laughs> because language writes us, in, as the classical poets knew. Uh, and now that production can be automated, um, we have machine-made subjectivity. Yep, here we go. The bad news is that on some level of the stack we're ensnared in prescriptive technologies of writing, and it's probably a bad thing for the overall viability of the world. A meter ecology seems to have incredibly powerful space binding capacities. The stack treats the entire earth as raw material to be dynamically quantified and extracted to meet the desires of users. Those users also being raw material to be quantified and extracted. And the stack seems incredibly bad, at, however, at time binding. None of this can last much longer, and we all know that. But that knowledge is peripheral to the goal of, expanding, uh, of expansion and concentration upon which the whole thing kind of runs. And I sometimes wonder what an avant-garde could look like now. And I have friends who uh, experiment with using AI as a holistic technology of writing, and here are three examples that I find really intriguing. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in the re results of, of this work. I'm not per inc entirely inclined to want to do it myself. Yeah? It's interesting to me when it presses on questions of how much the writer is written by the work rather than its author. 
And it's work that shows us where we are rather than where we could be is, is what I think. Maybe it's sort of uh, experiments that sort of describe a situation rather than sort of push it somewhere else. They're all interesting works, though. Um, it's conventional to think of literature as somehow partly immune to mass media and mass markets, but as Mark McGurl has shown, you know, Amazon is shaping a great deal of contemporary reading and writing. What uh, Dan Sinekin calls the conglomerate era of publishing started a long time ago, but accelerated in the Amazon era. And the content even of literary fiction ends up repeating the form of the book as a commodity in the digital age. So what might an avant-garde now look like? Or well, maybe very different from those of the past. It might not even want to be in advance of the general movement of culture and might not think in such militaristic terms, nor make such grandiose claims to change art and life. All the same, we might want some moves that can keep us, you know, sort of a little detached from being fully subsumed into the machinic production of our own subjectivity. Because like the automation of the production of our own subjectivity seems to me to be the, the thing to be most concerned about here. And if you'll permit me uh, to end on a brief note about uh, my own work, um, first let's revisit the avant-gardes and see what we can learn from them as like media avant-gardes, as inventors of strategies in and against the dominant media ecologies of their times. And second, let's think about language about how to have agency in using language, or better, having agency over the way language uses us. Let's find language that isn't just the repetition of habits or novelties promoted at us for the purpose of selling us a bill of goods. What's language that can confound predictive text and autocorrect? What then is language that describes the contemporary moment and how power articulates itself within this moment? And that's what I was trying to do in, in books like Capital is Dead, which starts with the question, you know, like, what if it's not even capitalism anymore, it's something worse? Like, what's a language that would describe that? Now, I'm not suggesting I have a grand theory to offer. Uh, and so third, what would a collaborative creation of knowledge look like where we're trying to put next to each other different kinds of knowledge drawing on different kinds of labour, which might give different perspectives uh, but where we can sort of have some comradely relation with our, our, our different languages, our different perceptions, our different grasping at the totality. And that was the work of these books, um, uh, Sensorian General Intellects. And what if we accept the proposition that we're moving into an era in which our own subjectivity is the product of being addressed, addressed as users by stacks? How can we write from inside what feels like, what that, how can we write from inside what that feels like and come to know it? And I turned to writing sort of auto-fiction and auto-theory to sort of address that through the example of my own formation across two different eras of media, sort of broadcast and the stack. And lastly, given how pervasive the stack is, perhaps we need somewhere to hide from it. And that's how I happen to be writing books like Raving, which is about sort of Brooklyn queer and trans rave scene, where on a good night you can find a few hundred people dancing in the dark, not looking at their phones for hours. Now, I know that's a low bar, but it's still an achievement to not look at your phone for hours. How can we create our own covens of care by repurposing the media tools at our disposal? And maybe it's not about being avant-garde anymore, but about being deserters. Like, how can we become deserters from the information war? And I'll leave you with that question. Thank you. Everybody. I'm going to perform a piece now. It's about half an hour long, um, and I need to say a couple of thanks uh, before I perform it. Um, this is a piece that I wrote a couple of years back, and I wanted to train a wide variety of different machine learning networks on a wide variety of different material. So in the video part for the piece, you'll see uh, some of these descriptions. Uh, you'll see a lot of or NN, CNN, and things like that. Uh, that doesn't mean the news network. It means recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks, these different types of machine learning um, algorithms that we could train on. Um, you don't need to worry about it if you don't understand the difference between a convolutional neural network and a recurrent neural network. Your phone does. 
Uh, so it's, it's processing everything that you type in there uh, through one of those networks. Um, but what it basically means is that there's different networks I use to train either sound, images, or text throughout the piece. Um, you have to create huge, huge databases um, for neural networks to train on so that it can learn about our culture before it starts to sort of implement its own. And I used a wide variety of material for this piece, ranging from notebooks of text that I've kept since I was a teenager, uh, through to hundreds of hours of James Brown and Britney Spears' voices abstracted from their recorded settings, Monteverdi operas, um, and many, many other sources, and you can see those in the video. And I'd finally just like to thank um, researchers that I worked with at Stanford, at King's College London, and also at DeepMind for helping, to, helping me to build these networks, gather the material, and train on them. So special thanks to Dan, Shekhar, Detlova, and Oriol.
I feel so much better already. I feel so much better already. Unbelievably better already. I'm truly better already. I feel so much better already. I feel so much better already. Unbelievably better already. I'm truly better already. Fast forward the doom. Forward the doom Fast forward the doom Fast forward the doom Maybe it's as good as listening to new age music in an airport, knowing that you are going home. Watch my hooky, the knot, 
the knot, the knot, the arm, you want to get the so oh what that oh baby oh baby oh baby you want to you want to you want to get you want to you want to quest to discover innovation in the wellness space, I found this pea milk. Okay, 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 this seems weird, but I am getting a romance vibe between those two and I am into it. Okay, 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 this seems weird. But there is intense and unbalanced melting and I am scared to death. I burned down your house with my mind. I burned down your house with my mind. I burned down your house with my mind.
okay. This seems weird. But there are edible herbs that can help your body adapt to stress. Okay, okay, okay. This seems weird. But teenagers and truckers who are not in relationships are talking to Siri. I burned down your house with my mind. I burned down your house with my mind. my out of your vagina and this one this one is to be sung while punching the air Noreen come here to me Noreen you need to get your hair done really it's a mess Noreen you've got to sort it out Noreen
it was observed that the distinguished Japanese professor of robotics interviewed on the museum video display did in fact himself look like a robot. It was something to do with the hair. The hair looked like expensive velvet. The hair looked like moss sprayed with a super black pigment patented by the military. The hair looked like it grew in black and then they dyed it black just to be sure. No, 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 no. It wasn't the hair, it was the skin. The distinguished professor of robotics skin looked resurfaced. It looked like there were no pores at all. It was like dewy royal icing. It was amazing. It was enviable. Let's get back to the robots, though. It was noted that the first robot created by the distinguished professor of robotics featured an approximation of the human secondary sex characteristics associated with the female gender. This robot was referred to as she. The robot wore a skirt and sleeveless jacket which brought to mind the fashion choices of women in religious cults in America. It was decided unanimously to refer to this robot as Karen. I don't know, it was a number of years ago. She just looked like Karen. It was observed that Karen's function is to sit, nodding and mm, murmuring affirmatively at whatever her conversational really partner is saying. Oh, really? No, no. It was observed, really, that to be Karen is to be trapped, oh yes, mm, for all eternity on the worst internet date in the history of the universe. It was related that multiple experiments have demonstrated that men and women typically overestimate how much women talk in conversation. Statistics were produced from published research detailing how any woman talking over 30% of the time in a given conversation is regarded as having talked over 50% of the time. The team concurred that this is just fucked. It was observed that Karen's voice came out of a speaker on the wall rather than through her He had been unable to conceal the fact that there was a logical explanation for his inability to alter the fact that they were supposed to be on the other side of the house. a model type with a rapper type and like 15 actor types oh 
I need you to scream some reassurance at me. I need some screaming, and I need some, you know, reassurance. You are okay. You are okay. You are okay. You are okay. So there's an American advertising executive's view of advertising versus my view of advertising versus Vince, the hipster who does the music for the advertising award shows for view of advertising versus an Italian advertising executive's view of advertising versus my university lecturer's view of advertising. Because if you perform happiness on social media, it is always rewarded, at least on social media. You are okay. You are okay. You are okay. You are okay. Because he is an illegal and he is a dead people. I have seen the studies and the information. I have seen the evidences. This is a belief that I have maintained and this is the origin point of the particular strain of the ideology. You are okay. 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 Despite what the doctors say. You see, the drummer on this track, his name is Kyle. Now, Kyle's not a real person. He's just a sort of a construct in the software that this music was written in. According to this software, Kyle is influenced by modern rock but comfortable with most genres. He's not even a person. He plays straightforward rock beats on a natural, versatile kit. Now, Kyle's friends are clearly going to have names like Cody and Tanner because Kyle has to be a white American guy with short blonde hair. But, oh no, wait a second, there's another type of Kyle. The difference is he's a white Australian guy and he's the life of the party. You are okay. 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 Despite what the doctors say. So I tried to make Kyle sound as funky as possible. There are options in the Kyle vector space for this. You know, I paired him with Crash the Party. I used samples like Disco Delight, Disco Freak, Funkin' Up and Drop the Funk, but Kyle just ended up sounding confused. Because this, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is as funky as Kyle gets. the lines of ending disease, winning the war on hunger, or at the very 
minimum living forever, or else you're paltry and measly. I will fight this with every fiber of my carbon-based being. Education is just too investment heavy and high risk. Instead, we need to be thinking about lifelong learning, the skills that we'll need to develop. Would I enjoy being empathetic in a medical setting? Could I learn to bite back my class rage so that I could massage the super rich without murdering them? I will fight this with every fiber of my carbon-based being. I will fight this with every fiber of my carbon My body is an excellent candidate for technological optimization, what with its inconvenient leaks and, you know, the exhausting task of trying to track the, the discharge and mucus and blood and blood pressure and steps and cycling and, and you know, just like, just, just stuff. of my carbon-based being. Humans, humans are the next platform. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to Joel and Sean and all the team here, sound and light and everybody. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, Jennifer Walsh, keep clapping. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, first uh, I think um, just one more round of applause for Mackenzie and Jennifer. Um, I mean my role is kind of like the prompt interface, trying to generate out outputs from both of you. So I'll just put an, an inane prompt out there. And um, but it's quite hard to think those two works together and formulate a response <laughs> straight away. Um, but I feel like, you know, Mackenzie, you kind of ga gave us this amazing, you know, history lesson and revision of, of the modernist avant-garde. And then Jenny, you kind of cosplayed all of them yeah, one, one after the other. Um, but maybe that's sort of a good place to start is, this, you know, this question of how that, that the relationship to the avant-garde in your work, which is kind of, um, in your case, Jenny, there's a kind of pastiche quality of, you, you know, reducing or equalising the avant-garde to something um, that kind of, yeah, you turn over and over and over, and in, in your case, Mackenzie, it kind of gets 
continually recalibrated as a, as a tactic in different ways. I don't know if either of you want to respond to that or to one another's work. Ah, where to begin? It's, it's sort of like there's, a, there's a, a giant elephant when we're like touching different parts of the elephant, trying to figure out what the elephant is in between when we sort of have two quite different. Uh, uh, I think I, I think I've got trunk texture over here, and maybe you've got ear texture or something. In which which part of the out. elephant are you yeah. touching? Elephant is all trunk, oh. all trunk. The whole the whole thing is all of elephant is tube-like. Is what happens if you start from where I am? When you start from where you are. No, no, no. Elephant is a plane. It's a surface and smooth. Yeah. So it's so we need more sort of like um, um, perceptions, I think, to figure out whatever happened to. Uh, media culture in the 21st century. I think the first thing is we don't know. I mean, it strikes me, you know, and I'm sort of still getting over, Jenny, you kind of interpolating James Brown and Britney Spears in that way. So I th think that's the thing that threw me more than anything in the, in the work. But I mean... So James um, Brown is sacred music to me. Yeah, so, so I'm like, that was confronting. And Brittany is also sacred. <laughs> just, just not to me. <laughs> right, that's the perfect comeback, right, too. But I think Brittany is a, very interesting, is a very interesting artist to look at because if we're talking about machine learning and we're talking about bots, uh, we're talking about personhood. And, Bert, and Britney Spears was a human person who had her personhood taken away from her and wasn't allowed to make decisions about her own body. So, you know, when we talk about whether the machines are coming for us, I'm like, well, humans are already coming for humans. That's dangerous enough. You, you know what I mean? It, it's not like the machines, I mean, part of me thinks like, what are they going to do that's worse? Do, do you know what I mean? That what humans have already done, you, you know, they'll just, the humans will use the machines to continue. So I, that's why I, when I talk about machine learning, I often talk about Brittany because of the conservatorship and how her personhood was taken away. Mm. But James Brown is also sacred to me. But when you um, were sort of inhabiting Britney as a kind of digital construction or something like that, it also got me thinking about, you know, Mackenzie, the way that maybe you sort of inhabit other writers or your, or your writing heroes and whether it's something similar in kind of writing through the personas of others or the identities of others in some way? I mean, there's 26 letters in the alphabet and a bunch of punctuation, and uh, I've not invented a letter. Uh, I'm just using the 26. And so, uh, you know, was it, um, uh, Baudelaire talked about language as, as made by, you know, it's like an anthill made by an entire colony of ants. and. Uh, one gets the fiction that one's done something with it, but really it's done something to you. Uh, it's like, like language is already a machine that makes us, um, and all you do is little variations on it. Um, but our, our ability to find what the patterns and procedures in that are just sort of took a quantum leap. Uh, and that's the part of it that I find kind of interesting, is, is what you could sort of like speculatively think was a, a, a kind of a, a structure and language in sort of like Roland Barthes era, you could now kind of empirically discover whether or not that holds. Uh, and that's kind of astonishing. Yeah, I loved the way that your talk kind of moved from these ex expansive strategies to the question of constraints. And yeah, I wonder, Jenny, you know, with you, with this sort of what Mackenzie's just said about the, the 26 letters and the incapacity to invent a new one, you know, whether you feel in kind of producing these musical performances, whether there is something like the constraint of an alphabet or a, or a grammar or a, or a limited vocabulary or whether it's endlessly iterative? I mean, I think, I, I think what's totally fascinating to me is just language itself and that language keeps changing and the way we speak and the slang that we use and the formulations. And I could just, like that's why the internet is, really, really interesting to me is because you just get to see all this language. You get to see it in real time. You get to see things change. You get to see uh, brands and political candidates desperately jump on the way language is being put together at that moment and try to co-opt it. 
And so, you know, what language feels like on the internet now is different to what it was six months ago, is different to what it was two years ago. So um, with those 26 letters, we keep coming up with new ways to communicate, new concepts to communicate, new emotions that we haven't communicated before. Um, so, so for me, that is an endless source of joy. <laughs> And, and when I pay attention to it, I can sort of see humanity burbling with life, you know, and, that's, I, and I find that deeply exciting, you know. Did you want to add something to that, Mackenzie? No. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, you're both um, sort of operating in this legacy of the death of the author and the sort of afterlife of the death of the author and you know the author doesn't fully die they have to sort of keep being killed over and over again and popping back up and uh, I really liked the sort of tr the turn of phrase in your talk Mackenzie towards the end where you said um, you know something that is happening now is the automation of the production of our own subjectivity which sort of it feels like an another death of the author of a different kind. Um, it's the death of the reader. Yeah. So in the, in the Roland Barthes version, the death of the author is in favour of the, the reader. Like the, the, it was uh, about the shifting of authority over interpretation to the point of view of the reader. And the, and the Foucault version is different. It's sort of about author function. So it's asked the question of to denaturalise authorship. Like what's the, what function does author perform when you, when you say there is one? And where aren't they? Where, where do they? Where, where do you think authors don't occur? There's whole swathes of language that seem not to have an author on it, you know. So there were sort of two slightly different um, questions there. But yeah, I'm sort of interested in like maybe a little bit alarmed by what happens when you automate the production of subjectivity in, in that kind of recursive and detailed way. It's different to the kind of extrusion of subjects out of like a mass broadcast era, um, which is just sort of um, Barth, Foucault, Pasolini way of understanding how subjects were made. That they're like mass produced objects. Mm. Uh, and, and now we're something else, like, you know, custom hamburgers or something, you know. Mm. What does that mean to you, Jenny? I mean, the idea of the death of the reader, you know, because a, a lot of the music that you would have produced using these strategies and techniques could never be listened to or would never be listened to. I mean, there's sort of, too, there's too much of it or perhaps it doesn't have the quality um, of as a kind of piece of music that anyone would desire, desire to listen to or could feel, you know, invested in. Well, I, what I think is quite fascinating, like as a musician who comes to, you know, who came to start researching machine learning was that I started to find all of these very weird artifacts. So I would find things like, um, you know, there was a study where they were using machine learning to see if um, young women with vocal fry, if that affected their chances of being hired. And so I found this research paper with an attachment which had a zip file with like 42 examples of somebody saying, thank you for considering me for this opportunity with all these different levels of vocal fry. And as an experimental musician, you're just like, gold mine, like, <laughs> thank you very much. Do you know what I mean? And then you're doing your show and you're like, and I'd like to thank, and there's this long list of, of authors of the paper. But I mean, I should say that, that to me has been very instructive and very interesting is when you dig into these data sets, you see what they're made of. Um, straight away, you, you sort of, like I remember the first, one of the first people that I worked with, with text generation, they were saying to me, you really need a data set the length of the Bible. So we use the Bible because it's right. in the public domain. And you're going, yeah. have you ever thought about what that means? And they're like, no, no, it's in the public domain. It's great. You know, um, so I, I don't know, like my, a lot, like that piece, I should say, I should hold up my hand as well and tell the truth, which is that like I made it all up. Um, so uh, there were no researchers um, who helped me generate all of the stuff. Uh, it's what I call a piece of speculative AI. Um, uh, no, no, I'm, I, have two, I have two classes in my work. I have speculative AI works and real AI works. So that's a speculative AI. 
But I will say that it's based in all that knowledge of reading all these papers. And I am quoting directly from certain research papers that DeepMind uh, produced, because when they produced WaveNets in 2016, and that was really important, because prior to 2016, if you were a musician and you wanted to be involved with machine learning, you had to play a MIDI instrument. And I, I'm a singer, so I, that was useless. Um, so like in 2016, DeepMind produced this WaveNets paper, and that you know, basically laid the path to Suno and Udio and all these platforms that generate pure sound, just like WAVs today. And they, when they did the research paper, they said, strangely enough, it produced these weird artifacts of like, you know, and again, if you're an avant-garde musician, you're like, I'll take that, thank you. Um, so so I, I, I think it's worth, I also have a large collection of Spotify patents, which are a whole other story. But it's sort of, I think it's really worth us as human beings trying to learn about this, even if we can never have a degree in computer science, at least trying to even read the odd research paper and you realize how cack-handedly it's being done. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, like when somebody says to you, we just use the Bible because it's, it's there in the public domain and it's the right length, mm. and there's no interrogation of that and no critique, do you know? Um, like, that's, like those are primary building block questions that I think us as artists trying to mess with the stuff do you know what I mean, uh, can, can ask of researchers? I immediately want to know, was it the King James? Was it the Geneva? Was it the, you know, like, <laughs> there's a thousand Bibles in English alone, you know. I, I think that's a level of detail they wouldn't right. be able yeah, to answer it's, it's you. It's like, yeah. exactly, it's just Bible. Yeah. I love that um, the Bible is perfect because it, it's the length of the Bible. Well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, one, it's one Bible unit. <laughs> So you were referencing DeepMind, but DeepMind didn't actually help you produce that work. Yes, this, this, this piece was not made with DeepMind. No, I mean, I've worked with, I've done lots of other pieces where I made huge data sets and we did train, but that, I made that piece in 2017 and it really came out of trying to get my head around what happened in 2016. Like there's, for those of you, maybe I'm based in London, June 23rd was Brexit. So, you know, there's sort of a clear, a clear cut of like when the madness began. And though I, we can trace, and I know Angela Nagel would trace the madness way back beyond then. But um, I was sort of trying to come to terms with that, but also trying to talk about AI without ha having access to like, you know, thousands and thousands in funding mm -hmm. to do these projects. So, so I, I think, I think for, for me, I'm a big fan of speculative literature. I love Stanislav Lem, you know, and, and um, I'm Irish, and so we're very interested in like sort of making things up completely. Yeah. And it's a part of our part of our, our culture. Um, so um, so sort of no, but this idea of like of like of of sort of speculatively, you know, playing with truth. Do, do you know what I mean? In order to try to see what it's made of. Um, without trying to, it, the, the intent is not to, to trick people or for them to feel foolish, do you know, or something. The intent is always just to sort of play, like in a very serious way. Hmm. I mean, Mackenzie, do you, do you want to sort of offer something on that, on sort of fabulation and fabrication and kind of the, the role it plays in your work and the kind of moving? I, it was actually the, the gift of Irish culture to Australia is actually the tall tale <laughs> and, the, and the, the furphy as we call them and so on. And, uh, the, the yarn, yeah, so it's, it's, it's sort of relatable, yeah, it's part of this culture as well. Um, I liked, there was a section where you were singing the words expensive, useless, meaningless, and it was sort of, it was unclear whether you were kind of talking about the products that have sort of produced or the, exp the experience of consumption or, yeah, I mean, can you say something about the affect of that piece? You, you know, like how it made, you know, yeah, just where it sits. Well, I'm, si I'm singing this death was expensive, this death was useless, this death right. was meaningless. And I suppose it's just what we all see side by side. D do you know what I mean when we open up the feed? I was very struck by the contrast recently between the, the Bayesian super yacht that sunk 
Do you know what I mean? And then the refugee boat that sunk, you know, a couple of days later, and one is considered, let's write a million pieces about it, and, you know, one is just considered people aren't even named. So, so sort of, I suppose that's the, that's the texture of the world we live in. I'm not trying to say, like, I'm better than that. Do, do you know what I mean? Or that I somehow understand the feed better. I'm just trying to... I'm just trying to pay attention to it, to remind myself to pay attention to it. And I'm, you, and you, you know, if you take a step back, you're like, yeah, we're getting all those images of like deaths here, deaths there. These ones are treated as meaningful, and then we should pay attention to them. And these ones are just brushed aside. So um, it's sort of that that came out of that sort of experience. Well, I'd like to think the old ones who dwell in the deep require the sacrifice of a billionaire every year. It's the and, orcas. Yeah. I mean, last, last year was the Let's Titanic thing, and, and this, this time it was the yacht, so yeah. it's a bi billionaire with that. year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but the, maybe we should get to masseuse. choose which billionaire we sacrifice yeah. every year to the old ones. And it's the masseuse that will <laughs> murder them. Such a vivid image, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just dwelling on that image for a moment. <laughs> <'cause>, uh, <laughs> um, I love the fake raving book, the Shanzai raving, and um, the whole section in your talk on free culture, net time, and the idea that it's not, you know, just our capitalism that is exploited, but our communism that's exploited too. And um, yeah, I, I wonder if you could sort of say a little bit more also to one another about that kind of um, melancholy perhaps around the way in which the freedom of information and, you, you know, as someone who was getting into experimental music and things like that in the late 90s, it suddenly was all there and it was a formative and educational moment, but the way that that has now been platformized and extracted and flipped, you know, but somehow comes out the other side in both of your works in a productive and generative way, nevertheless. I got a message from a friend, which was, I got something to give you, but I want to talk about online about what it is. And I'm like, I'm free now. Uh, you know, so we met and, and it was a hard drive. And I'm like, what's a hard drive? And uh, well, it's uh, an archive of 50,000 books. Uh, that's an artwork. A, a person I was told who it was made this artwork, and it's fifty. It's a library of fifty thousand books, and I'm like, like any gift, it's also like a bit of a curse. And I'm like, oh, what do I do with that? And I'm like, can I add to it? Also, can I take some stuff off it? Some things. I was looking through it. No, no, no. But, uh, and then, and I've I've given it to other people, and so it now, it's now like this little traveling artwork, you know. So it's like. And some will be dead ends where the drive died or someone's not interested in it. But it's, yeah, how can you have like this little like free gift of an entire library? It's like the Library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. you know, times 100 that will just go around and never be mentioned on the internet. It's not an archive that you could strip mine to produce something out of or sell advertising based on it, you know. So I just think that's a nice little model, you know, like how can we get information to kind of circulate um, where you sort of like desert from the larger structure and find some other way to pass it around. Hard drive's a nice old fashioned, mm. you know, sort of form of um, preserving and circulating that, you know. Because um, it's, it's, yeah, like we might want to uh, re engineer some of the tools that are available to kind of create cultures otherwise that are a little bit discreet and that the internet won't know about for a, for a minute and finds out eventually. But yeah, is there a way we can have our little, little you know, discrete worlds it seems to me to be a 21st century problem i mean i think i think what i what i realize i i feel very lucky about and you know when i was growing up everybody was telling me all the good stuff already happened do you know what i mean music history ended in 1970 <laughs> you know well before you were born um but what i do feel very lucky about is that all of my early work was not on the internet. Do, do you know what I mean? I could just make work. And, and I remember, you know, in my 20s, I would go to a festival and have a good time and maybe take some, 
you know, analog camera pictures, which I develop at the pharmacy. And my friends would say, how was, how was the festival? And I'd say, it was very nice. I met some great people. And that was it. There was no social media, you know, things like that. And I, I think maybe the, the uh, counter image I have when you're talking about your hard drive is like, I remember a friend of mine like burning, a composer burning all his scores. You know, and he just said, I just need to draw a line in the sand. You know, and he just set fire to it all, you know, on a hill and just sort of got on with his life. So I think, I think it's, and he's doing very well. Um, no, but I, I, I think it's sort of, it's this idea of like, what, what can you keep out of the eye of the algorithm? And like, what can you keep as your own private thing that you don't have to, you don't have to have witnessed by everybody else. And, and I do think it's tough because I see young artists starting out and they feel that unless they have loads of Instagram followers or unless they have loads of, you know, likes on Bandcamp, you know, their work isn't meaningful. And it's very difficult as a result for people to take huge risks. You know what I mean? And make work that might fail fail enough that they want to burn it on a hill. You, you know, so, and if they did, they'd feel that they needed to film it in Instagram story, it being burnt on the hill, you know, or something. But, but so I do think, I, I find myself, there's a lot of my life that I do try to keep very much out of the private, you, you know what I mean, off the feeds, even though that little monster in your head is like, oh, you should take a portrait format photograph because Instagram will like that better, mm -hmm. you know, even though you're f f filming a landscape. <laughs> like, so, so I, th I think it's, I think it's a difficult thing, and I, and I, and I feel we should, we should guard people's offline lives. We should guard their activities. Do you know what I mean? And let that be a protected space where they can mm -hmm. be free. I mean, by by the same token, you know, I can go to my local club and hear techno that's amazingly good with sub bass that you could never get out of vinyl that's been sourced from all over the planet uh, and it'll be completely different you'll never hear the same track played twice you know because everyone is sourcing from different places mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah I, I don't want to come off as like Luddite you know yeah 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 uh, yeah like like sometimes it's kind of amazing um, you know the the things that are possible but it's sort of like that thinking tactically about um, what the transaction is, like if you've yep. got access to a piece of media or culture through a technology, like what's the transaction you've unwittingly signed on to uh, and to maybe just sort of think a little bit about that bargain because maybe it was the devil that, that you signed the EULA agreement with um, and to maybe sort of pick and choose among those available pathways and strategies. I mean, one thing that I find myself thinking about a lot is that um, I work a lot with John Lidecker, who's in Negative Land, and sort of so John would have been like ad busters back in the 90s and 2000s. And John and, John and I have talked a lot about the fact that when you listen to, you know, different machine learning platform CEOs talking about music in particular, they're talking like the, the people who did sampling in the 90s did. <laughs> They're saying everything should be open and, you know, it all should be there for the taking and we should, you know, remove the barriers to doing music. And they're talking like the copy left, you know what I mean? The copy left community talk, they're talking like Plunder Phonics talked. They've now co-opted that language and the record labels, you know, are the ones and the artists are the ones saying, no, that is my work. <laughs> you know, so there's been this strange reversal. Do, do you know what I mean? So when you're talking about the bargain, do you know, I like, it's, what do I do with all my MP3s? <laughs> Where do they come from? And LimeWire, um, but like, what does it mean, you know? Yeah, tactics change. And, but also it was uh, a kind of, uh, there's a level of social struggle in it. Like there was a social movement to free information from constraints of intellectual property, but that kind of got recuperated at a more abstract level. And a whole other kind of version of extraction got built on it. So it's like, all right, we, we had a tactic that worked for a minute. Yeah. And that got recuperated, so you change tactics. So I love Plundophonics, for, for instance, and the amount of work to make those tracks, and now someone could probably do that in a weekend, you know, with the tools now available, would still not be as amazing. Um, but yeah, it's like, oh, okay, those are the tactics of that era, but, but this is a different era. Yeah, totally. And also, I mean, um, those artists you mentioned, Negative Land, or, you know, John Oswald, or thinking earlier, figures like James Tenney, you know, the aesthetic project was sort of revolutionary too, and it was to kind of satirise and undermine cap capital, you know, rather than cons consolidate it or sort of acu accumulate it. So it had a sort of similar, you know, technical strategies, but a, but a different kind of political project altogether, which is, 
But are we nostalgic for that time in some way, or are we sort of... God, no. Like, I grew up, you couldn't... I grew up in Ireland, you know, you couldn't get access to stuff. The, the story I always tell is, you know, you looked at pictures in books, and you tried to imagine what the avant-garde was. And, like, my friend, he went to see a Robert Wilson show for the first time, and he was really shocked that it had colour in it, because he thought it was all black and white, because he'd only mm. ever seen, you know, pictures in books. So I don't ever want to go back to that time when it was difficult to have access to culture, you, you know, so I'm not nostalgic for that, do you know? Um, I'm not nostalgic for that, and I think it would be criminal to be nostalgic for something we had that, like, my niece and nephew can't have access to, you know? Mm. Yeah, I missed the 60s because I was born too late and everyone's like, oh, you missed it. And I'm like, fuck that. We're going to do something more interesting, you know, but I want, particularly with students, it's like, well, just make it now, you know. I don't, I don't want to be telling people you missed the 80s, you know, like, like to hell with that, you know, like there's, there's, but the possibility, the space of possibility changes and sometimes it's more constrained and so, you know, so it's, it's thinking tactically about what's possible in culture and you think people will be saying, you missed the 2020s, they were so <laughs> awesome. I, I mean, it's, and, you know, like I, I wrote a whole book on, on, you know, like Brooklyn, like rave culture now, and, and everybody's like, oh, it was better two years ago, you know? Yeah. Well, like, come on, you know? <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> Actually, during the pandemic was fucking awesome, you know? It was, it was all like renegades out in parking lots and stuff. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's an impulse to sort of resist, but, but to the, like the meta thing to learn from past avant-garde is not, oh, let's repeat that gesture, but it's more that gesture was a tactic in that context, and my job is to think of gestures in a different context. Mm -hmm. So you, there's sort of like a meta lesson from it, um, rather than the, the, the repetition machine uh, is going to be, the culture industry is going to repeat what the avant-garde did, so we don't have to do that. You have to like come up with something else. I think that's a really nice note to maybe end it on. Um, Jenny and Mackenzie have been um, in Melbourne for a week or more, a couple of weeks, and done a huge amount of work, workshops, lectures, performances all over town in clubs and theatres and various spaces. So it's been an amazing effort. Thank you both for coming all this way. Well, to thank be you, here. Joel. For thank you so us. much. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you all for coming.